Hello and welcome to our sixth and final lecture about measuring stress and strain in the geodynamics course. In this lecture we're going to talk about modern strain measurements. So we only have one goal for this lecture and that is to present the basic concepts of modern space-based strain measurements. And this won't be in any great detail, it's mainly just to tell you a little bit about two particular space-based techniques, and that is GPS and INSAR. As we've seen, triangulation is something that was historically widely used, but it's difficult and can be quite limited. However, our advances in technology, um, particularly in space based geodesy have basically made measuring fault motions or plate motions using GPS or other techniques uh, a great deal easier than triangulation and much less expensive. GPS, as uh, I've already alluded to, is probably the most widely used and popular technique and probably the thing that's most familiar to you since many of you probably have a GPS device that's part of a smartphone that might be in your pocket or whatever. Survey quality GPS device, one that's uh, used by um, people who make these GPS measurements, can resolve positions on the surface of the earth to centimeter scale. So you can imagine that finding the location of a given point on the surface of the earth um, and then from that measurement uh, over several years calculating the movement of a given point on the surface of the Earth is something that can be done with a great deal of accuracy. What we're going to do now is take a look at a couple examples of GPS-based uh, observations. And the first case comes from somewhere nearby, of course, looking at the case of glacial isostatic adjustment. So this is the uplift of the Earth's surface following the removal of ice sheets after the last Ice Age, so from about uh, nine or 10,000 years ago uh, when the ice sheets were melting away to presently land surface has been rebounding or moving up uh, gradually through time. And so over this um, time period, there have been a number of sites where uh, GPS has been used to measure the motion of the Earth's surface. And we can look here at one um, site in particular that is the Kive site, which is shown here by the red star, K-I-V-E. And we have the three components of motion for this GPS uh, instrument that was sitting at this site and about 10 years of data. You can see here on the top plot, the north offset, beneath that is the east offset. And in both cases, you can see that you're falling basically right along the zero millimeters offset line. There's a little bit of, of wiggling in there, but there's no trend to this data. Essentially, we don't see any significant movement to the north or to the east on either of these plots. However, if we look at the vertical movement, the upward offset, there's a clear linear trend here that shows uplift of the surface over the last 10 years. And I would guess at this site, you're probably looking at something like, um, maybe four millimeters a year of uplift. As you get closer to the Gulf of Bothnia, the rate of uplift uh, is a bit faster in places up to about 10 millimeters per year. Here, the, the uh, position here in central Finland is probably a bit slower than that. But nonetheless, you can see very clearly here a trend of vertical motion recorded in the GPS data. As another example, we can look here in, um, in Baja, California at a case along the San Andreas Fault, or I guess maybe this is Southern California rather, but along the San Andreas Fault no, nonetheless, where we have two plates that are moving past one another and of course a major strike-slip fault in between them. And so we have the gradual plate tectonic motions that result in the buildup of elastic strain uh, along this fault zone and deformations distributed over tens of kilometers as we saw from our earlier calculations, about 40 kilometers on either side of the San Andreas that we have some, uh, some deformation. And so when we have earthquakes, of course, we have fault slip and we, some of that motion is recovered. But in the time in between major earthquakes, you can, if you take a profile across here from A to A prime, you can observe a gradual displacement of the 
surface of the earth. So here we are crossing several different faults, the Southern San Andreas, the San Jacinto Coyote Creek, and uh, Eisenhower faults. And as you go across these different faults, you can see that the velocity from one side to the other gradually changes so that you've got about maybe 15 millimeters per year of velocity difference from one side of the San Andreas system to the other and then distributed sort of um, gradual bending or, or elastic strain across the area in between. So here we have another example where GPS data, in this case, um, shown in both the circles and triangles, can clearly help us define the distributed deformation across the San Andreas fault system. The other technique that we're going to take a look at just quickly is called INSAR or Interferometric Synthetic Aperture Radar. It's kind of a mouthful, but it's another space-based technique where we're using something called synthetic aperture radar images of the same location at different times to determine how positions on the surface of that location have changed with time. And so most typically this is done uh, with a, an image from before an earthquake and then following the earthquake to give us a sense of how much surface motion there has been across a very broad area. The images themselves are a backscatter image from the Earth's surface, so essentially you have a signal that comes down from a satellite, strikes the surface of the Earth, and then bounces back up, and it's received by a sensor on the satellite. And these signals that are sent off are typically microwave um, radiation, and so they have a wavelength, of course, like any wave. They propagate down to the surface and they bounce off the Earth's surface. And the total time that that takes place and the sort of um, position in the, the wave length or the, the wave itself um, can be used then to determine how much motion or how much difference there is between the last time that this image was taken and the, the next time. So essentially what you have is a phase shift in the wave. So that's what's shown here with a sine wave shown in, in red and then another sine wave shown in blue where there's an offset of the position here where you're crossing the axis, um, then in this case the offset's indicated as theta. Here's an example of what one of these interferometric, interferometric um, images looks like. They are kind of crazy to look at because you've got these kind of radiating rainbow patterns, but what each one of these um, patterns is indicating is a certain amount of displacement on the Earth's surface. So you can see over here in the regions that are kind of blue and green that aren't changing color very much, these are areas where there hasn't been much motion of the Earth's surface before and after or when these two images are um, laid upon one another. Whereas there are other areas where you have tightly packed bands of different colors and the colors are the offset or the, the wavelength offset you have between the two images. And so you can see the color band here starts at zero and goes up to the red color, which would be the equivalent of two pi. And then it's going to loop around. So, you know, when you have these different bands of colors that repeat themselves, this is indicating to you that, you know, here you have uh, maybe a full two pi offset, and then here's another two pi and another two pi. Each one of those wavelength offsets represents a certain amount of displacement of the Earth's surface. In this case, for the image we're looking at from Baja, California, this is um, about 2.8 centimeters for each one of these color cyclings. So each full cycle of color is going to represent about 2.8 centimeters of motion of the Earth's surface. You can see when you get down in here, uh, close to the fault that's traced off in this dashed line here, that it's really messy in here but you can see that there are many repeating cycles of these colors, and so um, if you add those up, you might get something close to the 1.2 meters of fault slip that was observed on the ground. The great thing about these kind of images, these INSAR images, is that you can get very high resolution uh, maps, essentially, of the displacement of the Earth's surface. All right, so that's it. Just a quick um, couple points about GPS and INSAR. As always, it's time for your quiz. Let's see what you've learned. And that's our final lecture on the topic of measuring stress and strain. 
and we'll move on in our next set of lectures to something new.